fantastic. So I'm Laura. I'm a PhD student based out of Victoria University in Wellington uh, in New Zealand, not to be mistaken for the one over here. Uh, and I also work down at the Cawthron Institute in Nelson. And I work on, I'm now told it's called microcolius formidium, will probably still slip in because it's hard to break three years of habit uh, in a few weeks. Uh, so we work on microcolius um, and in particular because it produces some really nasty toxins and causes massive issues uh, in New Zealand. So I'm going to give you a bit of an introduction to microcolius because it's quite different from the, the blooms that you get over here. Um, so we get big benthic proliferations of microcolius. It's a filamentous cyanobacteria and it grows on the river benthos so it forms these really thick mats which you can see uh, on rock substrates and the bottom pitch you can't see very well, hopefully the next one will show it up. The dark black brown spots are all microcolius uh, growing on the river benthos. And the main reason that we're concerned about it is it produces uh, four variants of anatoxins, which are neurotoxins that have killed over 100 dogs uh, in New Zealand, but they've also killed dogs over in France, and they uh, cause problems uh, in California as well. And I think the more people look, the more they realise that they might potentially have an issue with microcolius. And one of the major contrasts, which kind of leads into the second half of my talk, um, to systems here is that they grow in really low nutrient waters and particularly really low in dissolved reactive phosphorus, um, which is quite unusual. Most people associate cyanobacterial blooms with eutrophication uh, and high nutrient inputs. In these systems, they're growing in our quite reasonably pristine rivers. So we have some slightly elevated dissolved inorganic nitrate, um, but really, really low dissolved reactive phosphorus. So I thought I'd just quickly show you, hopefully that'll work. No, it's not going to work. That's all right. This is one of our blooms. Um, we did have some drone footage, but you can just see the nice pretty picture. No, it's telling me that QuickTime's not available. That's all right. Um, you can see, though, in this picture the extent of these blooms. So all of these tyre tracks are the, the river substrate where people have been driving through the river. Uh, and all of this really dark black black-brown material is microcolius, and this bloom happened last summer, so November last year, and ended up with um, the regional council, which kind of controls the river, advising people not to swim for the entire length of the river just downstream of the water intake. So it was a really big issue for recreation as well. Um, this river flows through a reasonably large um, city and is well known as a recreational area. So. Phil's kind of given a really good introduction to a lot of what I'm going to talk about today. But one of the main things that's really cool about microcolius is the massive spatial heterogeneity we have in the amount of toxin that we can detect in these blooms. Uh, and so if we go out to a river and we collect samples, so at that Hutt River bloom, we set up three transects um, and took five samples from each transect. We managed to detect differences in toxin content, uh, content between 12 and 2,000 milligrams per kilogram, um, which was a huge variation um, on the same river at the same site within uh, the transects were, I think, 10 metres apart. Um, so you're looking at 15 metres by the width of the river, which is a lot of variation. And we know that part of that is probably because we have multiple strains coexisting in the mats. Uh, and so we have some strains that are capable of producing toxins, some that aren't capable of producing toxins at all. And among the toxin, toxic strains, um, we can get up to 100-fold variation in the amount of toxin and the different ratios of those um, types of toxins produced. And so we had a few questions associated with that, but also we wanted to, to try and tease out why it grows in such low nutrient waters or, or how it is able to accumulate such large biomass um, when the dissolved reactive phosphorus is often at or below detection limits in the river water. So overall, we wanted to find out whether the, the changes in anatoxin concentrations that we were seeing out in the field uh, reflected shifts in genotype ratios between toxic and non-toxic microcolius, and then also look at whether nutrients play a role in um, the alkaline phosphatase activity, so APA is alkaline phosphatase activity. Um, so whether we have nutrients or toxigenicity um, playing a role in the activity of alkaline phosphatase enzymes. <coughs> 
So starting off with um, a qPCR which we used to look at the ratio of toxic to total genotypes, and this has been done with a lot of other cyanobacteria, um, we had to develop something that would work with microcoleus. Um, so we've targeted the NSC gene and we tried to make it microcoleus specific so that we're able to go out um, and not detect any other anatoxin, potential anatoxin producers because microcoleus is the only one that we have in our rivers. Um, so we wanted to make sure it was really robust for sampling. We then applied that uh, in concert with a 16S um, rRNA assay, and that was a cyanobacterial specific one. So we're characterising the entire cyanobacterial community there and comparing the amount of toxic cells to that entire cyanobacterial community. We determined the toxin quotas or anatoxin quotas, uh, and in this case, um, like Phil was talking, you can uh, characterise that in a whole load of different ways. Microcoleus presents a lot of challenges to using things like flow cytometers because it's benthic and it's filamentous. So we characterise that as the amount of toxin that was being produced per toxic cell. So we were able to relate that to our gene copy numbers from the NSC assay so that we could actually look at whether the changes in toxin content was related um, to the amount of toxin being produced per toxic cell in those samples. Uh, and then finally we determined the percentage that was uh, actually toxic microcoleus. And we had 122 samples across 10 rivers. Some of those reflected um, samples that were collected over time. And there were two sites that we had samples collected from five or six sites on the same river on the same day. And we got some really cool results out of this. Um, so I'll go through this reasonably slowly. But we have our percentage of toxic cells on the x-axis. Um, no, both of the scales are logarithmics because there are such wide variations in the amount of toxin that we're getting um, in the percentage of toxic cells as well. And we've got total anatoxins on the y-axis. And we get a really good relationship um, between the percentage of toxic cells that we're getting in our community uh, and the total toxin content, which is really cool. But the other thing is the variation that we do see, so the scatter around this line, typically the, the sample's up high, in this case they're from the Ashley, Cadrona and Hutt rivers, tend to have higher anatoxin quota uh, than we would expect for that percentage of toxic cells, whereas below the line they have lower than expected toxin quota. And that probably reflects the ability, or the, the strains that we do have. So within our toxic strains we have hundredfold differences in the ability to produce toxins. And it's likely that in some rivers we just have more strains that are capable of producing more toxin than we do in other rivers. So the Huck, Drona and Ashley River likely have more strains that are capable of producing uh, greater levels of toxin. Or at least those strains are dominant in those rivers. So just to reinforce that variability as well, so again, we've got a logarithmic scale, and this is percentage of toxic cells by river. Um, we've got huge variability within rivers. So the Cadrona and Hutt rivers were the two rivers that we had five and six sites um, down um, the river gradient, whereas all the other rivers were the same site sampled over time. And so there's a lot of variability um, within each river, but also between rivers. And we have one standout river, the Ashley River, that typically had really, really high, compared to everything else, um, percentage of toxic cells. So the mean percentage of toxic cells in the Ashley was about 9%, um, and it had up to 30% toxic cells, which is pretty um, impressive. So it kind of starts to spark some questions about what might be driving some of those changes, because obviously that does seem to affect the toxin content, which is what we care about as far as regulating and managing these blooms. Um, and so we wanted to, to have a look at that. So as far as this first part goes, we were able to conclude that anatoxin content was definitely related to the dominance of toxic strains, um, but there was a large variability in that relative abundance uh, and that toxin quota uh, probably plays a role. So the dominance of different toxic strains within those mats plays a role in the total toxin content. But then we had this question, what about environmental factors? What might drive those changes? So we did collect environmental data when we got all of these samples, um, but they were collected from a whole load of different uh, studies. And when we tried to apply our massive statistical analyses, because we've got so much variability, we can't uh, get, get good resolution from the models. But there were a few um, key factors that came out no matter what we did. Um, and those included uh, dissolved inorganic nitrogen, dissolved reactive phosphorus, and conductivity. And so looking at just one of those factors, dissolved reactive phosphorus, which was one we were already interested in, 
we decided to do a little bit more work. And we wanted to know whether potentially the ability to uptake alternative phosphorus sources using the alkaline phosphatase enzyme, which lets them make use of organic phosphorus, could explain some of the variation in the um, distribution of the toxic and non-toxic genotypes in the rivers. So we ran a, a big experiment um, where we took four toxic strains and four non-toxic strains uh, in the lab and we homogenised those, we starved them of phosphorus for a week and then we put them into one of four different treatment media. So we had one which was our baseline happy levels um, with lots of dissolved reactive phosphorus, lots of organic phosphorus. Um, we had two in the middle with opposite uh, and one at the bottom that had low dissolved reactive phosphorus and low organic phosphorus. So these guys in theory should be really stressed and, and wanting phosphorus from wherever they can get it. Uh, they were then incubated for 24 hours and we harvested them um, by centrifugation and then processed them. So we ran a fluorometric assay with a methyl umbrifluoral phosphate or MUP. Try to say that 10 times fast. Um, incubated them for an hour and then we terminate the reaction and read that in a, a plate reader um, with standard curves of the hydrolyzed product, the fluorescent product, which is methyl umbrifluorone. And we got some cool results out of this too. I really like cool results. Cool results are fun. So we're going to go through uh, each of these. But on the, the x-axis, we have strains. So we had our four non-toxic strains on the left and toxic strains on the right. And our different colours are our different treatment media. So yellow is our super happy state. Dark purple is our not very happy state. Uh, and then we have our two other treatments in the middle. So we have um, high DRP. On, in the green and low DRP in the blue um, and they have the swap of the organic phosphorus and we've got our alkaline phosphatase activity on the y-axis. The first thing that kind of sticks out at you is that there looks to be a difference between toxic and non-toxic strains. So overall um, the toxic strains typically produce more alkaline phosphatase activity than the non-toxic strains regardless of treatment. Um, once you start getting into the, the details we have a greater ability to upregulate alkaline phosphatase activity in the non-toxic strains. So with the exception of this one, which doesn't upregulate quite as much, they almost double their alkaline phosphatase act activity when they're nutrient stressed uh, compared to their happy state. In comparison, the toxic strains, even though they do have higher alkaline phosphatase activity, don't seem to upregulate their uh, activity nearly as much, which indicates that potentially they do have that higher initial need for alkaline phosphatase, so they might have higher nutrient requirements, for example, um, but their ability to upregulate that is not necessarily as high. Um, what was definitely interesting was this blue treatment here, though, because we gave them lots of organic phosphorus and we incubated them for 24 hours, and in the non-toxic strains, they brought their levels of alkaline phosphatase activity back down to pretty much baseline levels within that 24 hours, whereas in the toxic strains, they didn't do that. There was still a slightly increased level in most of them, this one was a bit of an outlier, but in most of our strains we had uh, an increase in alkaline phosphatase activity over baseline levels after that 24 hours. So it looks like probably, even though they are able to increase their regulation, 24 hours isn't enough for them to get back to their happy state, hydrolyze enough phosphorus for them to be happy. Um, the other thing to note here is that there's lots of variation between strains, and the variation between strains, we've only used H, um, we had a selection of 27, and out in the world there's hundreds and thousands of more, I'm sure. And so that strain-to-strain -strain variability makes predictions about whether this is going to drive changes in strain dominance out in the field really, really difficult, and I don't think we can yet conclude that this is what's happening. So overall, where are we at? I think that alkaline phosphatase is probably um, a, a use or a, a method of uh, phosphorus acquisition uh, in microcoleus, and I think that we probably need to start looking at using, um, um, extending our monitoring to include looking at organic phosphorus sources um, so that we can uh, look at the impacts of those as well as our dissolved reactive phosphorus in our monitoring programs. I think that we probably need to start looking at the regulation of these as well so that we can see what is driving some of that strain to strain variation. Uh, and then applying some of this to field uh, experiments and mesocosm experiments. So we have done some field work, uh, and one of our next steps is to apply this to a mesocosm experiment. So we've applied both the quantitative PCR and the alkaline phosphatase assay on samples where we've seeded rocks with a 50-50 
uh, mix of toxic and non-toxic microcolia so we can control the inoculum source and look at how um, that changes, so how the ratio of toxic to non-toxic changes over mat development uh, and how alkaline phosphatase activity changes as well. Um, so there's some cool things coming up um, and as Phil said, watch this space I think as far as all of that goes. And I'd just like to thank all the different uh, funders and groups that have supported me throughout my PhD uh, to get to this point as well. And I'll take any questions. So that you could express your results in something similar to what Phil showed us in terms of toxin per cell as opposed to toxin per percent toxic species? Yeah, so in this case it was the toxin per toxic cell. So when we had the percentage of toxic cells against the um, total toxin content, we also have a toxin quota which was the size of the circles. I didn't show the graph, so I've got like a whole load of graphs and I had to pick some. Um, <laughs> but yes, we, we do know that the, um, the amount of toxin is related to, so the amount of toxin is related to the percentage of toxic cells, but that there is a role of the absolute number of toxic cells to the toxin content as well, if that makes sense. So the variability within a single strain, does it fall within that window of three to four? Uh, so that's not something that we tested. So these were all environmental samples, but I think Susie's done some work previously where it was about two and a half times, about two and a half fold increase in toxin production within a single strain. Maybe I'm wrong and I read something a long time ago. <laughs> okay, I'm, yep, I'm not sure. <laughs> yes, this, uh, this is not about the benthic, I'm um, trying to talk about the water column cyanobacteria, so it's uh, the question for the audience as well. When we talk about the concentrations, sometimes, particularly when there's a luxury uptake, as we claim, when the when the bloom is going to be triggered and all sorts of things. Sometimes concentration is a bad concept because if the, if the nutrients are going to be taken up by the cyanobacterial population, if someone is going to say this particular concentration is going to be the bloom uh, trigger number, uh, ongoing again, if it's a well-established cell and we are playing with the concentration versus the natural environment where concentration itself is going to play you know, the, the bloom dynamics, how exactly we talk about concentration in environmental samples, is it the right way of doing it? Not only for surface, but also for the water column cyanobacteria. Yeah, so I can't speak so much for the water column cyanobacteria, but certainly benthic um, cyanobacteria like microcoleus, once they've started to develop a mat, the conditions within that mat are completely different from the overlying water column. So measuring water column nutrients is probably not going to give us much information about what's going on inside the mat. Um, so a good example of that is you can get, I think it was a 30 times the amount of phosphorus inside the mat material if you take that out and squeeze it into a, a container and, and measure that compared to taking a grab sample of the overlying water column. So what those cells are experiencing is probably quite different from what we've traditionally measured and I think that's certainly a limitation of, of what we've done so far and I think that's probably something that we need to, to look at going forward. Yep. This is a question coming from pure ignorance. Um, in, in some lake situations, anatoxin A leaks out into the free water body in quite considerable amounts, as against microcystis, which generally stays in the cells. You have um, dogs being poisoned. Are they being poisoned because they're crunching up filaments of toxic um, organisms, or do they drink the water and get poisoned? It's an interesting question. Dogs really seem to like the smell of microcolias, so it produces MIBs and geosmins, and they, so when the mats are really well developed, they quite often detach from the rocks, and they wash up on the side of the riverbank, which is where the highest risk to them is, and they actually actively seek it out and eat it. Um, and I think with that highest toxin uh, content that we measured, it takes about a quarter of a tablespoon to kill a 25 kilo dog, um, which is not a lot. Um, but we can detect anatoxins in river water as well, but you'd have to drink quite a lot of it for it to, to have an effect, yep. Yeah. 
the different parts of the river? Yeah, that one. Yep. So, so is that qPCR data on the x-axis versus toxic uh, concentration on the y? Is that what that is? Yep, so total anatoxins measured through LCMS and then the percentage of toxic cells. So that's the, the ratio of NAC to 16S gene copies. Yep, so just, just a point um, on that. So some of that scatter could be differences in ploidy. Not yes. In, yes. So we made the assumption, um, based on some previous work, that there are, on average, in cyanobacteria, 2.3 copies of the 16S gene. So we use that in calculating the data. Um, but that's definitely a limitation of, of the 16S gene for these types of studies. You're showing that over a few orders of magnitude there, so unlikely to be the sole, the sole thing, but could account for some of that noise. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, join me in thanking Laura for the talk. And we're now at the end of the session for this morning session. Um, and uh, could you just join me in thanking all the speakers? I think they all gave fantastic presentations. Thank you.